So, um, sorry for the long delay. Uh, a new episode's coming out because um, I have life stuff to deal with, and that barred me from uploading new videos. <sighs> also, uh, we're going to be skipping several chapters because uh, due to the pandemic, College Board has decided to cut a lot of content from the exam. And so I will be so several chapters several chapters will not be covered. So don't be surprised if you see missing chapters. Chapter six, by the way, covers civil rights. Uh, you know, basically the str basically um, the struggle to ensure protections of minorities from tyrannical majorities. And in this case, minority means you know, instead of you know the found the founding father definition, which was rich white men. This time it's. Um, you know, dis you know, I you know usually disenfranchised or marginalized groups that have historically faced law enormous amounts of discrimination, and th this chapter also covers a struggle to ensure that everyone has those civil rights, regardless of their skin color, creed, origin, or what lang or what languages they speak. So, like you know, basically, like when we think of civil rights, we think of this you know we think of this image you know, um, people basically everyday citizens marching for you know equal rights uh you know and an end discrimination based on arbitrary lines so in terms of progress um there was no progress regarding civil rights between the end of the civil war and 1965 the signing of a civil rights act with the civil rights act i believe or the voting rights act one of those two um you know, you could I could rattle off an endless list of injustices, for, uh, you know, inflicted on minorities, especially African Americans, like legal segregation, lynch, legal segregation, brutal lynchings, sharecropping, which is basically slavery in a new name, in a different form, redlining, which basically like marked off low quality. Basically, the term gets the the, the term redlining gets the term gets its name from the practice of. Uh, basically, federal agents or banks drawing red lines on a map to demarcate which areas of crappy property will only be reserved for African Americans, and thus, you know, um, only like, they'll only give out loans to blacks for this crappy piece of property, and not in like you know places where in like in nice neighborhoods where whites mostly lived, you know. And of course, there's many others. You know, this is where the whole Green Book idea came from. You know, a list of uh, like a list of the very few establishments that blacks could actually go to without without facing in, without facing the humiliation of segregation. There was there has been real, but it's f but fragile and spotty progress since then. Between 1963 and 2003, black white high school the black white high school graduation gap narrowed by 57 points. There's also been a 23 point gap reduction in the poverty rate. And now there are more blacks in college and in home and owning homes. Now, uh, if you're just now, like, if you're just curious for some extra civil rights info for a piece of like writing that's very important to the civil rights era, to civil rights movement, it's the letter, it's uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. Basically, um, he's saying that like a lot of the whites, uh, even the moderate whites who aren't blatantly racist accused the black accused black civil rights protesters of being outside agitators and his response is basically the letter he argues that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere and he also encourages people to go beyond the super go beyond that of the superficial social analyst who looks only at the effects and not actually examines the underlying causes for example in this case he's criticizing the white moderates who complain about the about blacks protesting but don't understand why they're protesting to begin with he also and like in order he also argues for the for for the fight for justice he argues for a collection of facts negotiation self purification basically like you know um preparing oneself for direct for direct action and direct action is like you know the final step of you know protesting marching sit ins and whatnot now, he also uh, remarked that there's always a like you know creative tension. Basically, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. In this case, the what you know white people wouldn't really be willing to you know give blacks their rights unless if, until the until the blacks fight for a tooth and nail. He he references a variety of theologians and philosophers like Socrates, Buber, Niebuhr. Uh, to like Augustine, Paul, Jesus, Jefferson, Amos, and Luther. So yeah, very like you know well grounded in Western philosophy and theology. 
He rem- he comments about how the nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet like speed toward the goal of political independence, while America just is moving at horse and buggy pace. He says this is wrong because justice too long is too long delayed is justice denied. You know the patience, you know the tension between patience and the fierce urgency of now. He also said that you know sin is separation or separation is basically just wrong. And he also said, like, you know, uh, white moderates' l- lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. He's saying, essentially, that it's more frustrating to deal with moderates who are on the fence rather than people who are, um, who are vehemently opposed to, to, sec- to uh, integration because it's easier to, it's easier to point out the extremists. He also commented, speaking of extremists, he also, uh, he also warned that if you know, white leaders don't choose him, don't like cater to his demands for integration, then African Americans are going to turn to radicalism, you know, especially that of Malcolm X, who was, you know, what one of the most vocal contempor- vocal rivals of MLK, as well as the Nation of Islam. He also uh, asked white leaders, uh, sorry, that's an antivirus scan. He also asked uh, white religious leaders, are your churches just social clubs following popular opinion, or are they actually interested in achieving real progress so to just give you an idea of where we once was what what you were where america once was this was basically a legal practice of a segregated water fountain think about that you know just by the color of your skin you are only allowed to go only do only drink at a certain water fountain which was usually of lower quality so obviously, how do you? How did you know African Americans fight against this massive, in, you know, institutional racism that was, that they def- that was um, oppressing them? So they had a multi multi pronged strategy, that was both nonviolent and sometimes violent. <clears throat> Nation of Islam and Black Panthers. He also they also. African Americans also leveraged Cold War shame. They knew that the Soviet Union loved to criticize America for its ra- for its for uh, racism in its uh, propaganda. In its um, propaganda, uh, you know the famous quote was, you know, every time so- the Americans criticized the Soviet Union for some major injustice, the Soviet Union will reply, "Well, you lynch Negroes. Basically, you're no better because you treat your blacks as second-class citizens." This would help explain why many African countries would turn to the Soviet Union rather than the Americans, because the USSR successfully, you know, convinced many African countries, "Hey, don't trust the Americans. Why would you trust? Why would they? Why would you trust them to treat you you with respect when they don't even treat their own blacks with respect?" They um, conducted efforts at the state and national level um, using civic organizations, especially churches. MLK was a pastor, was a black pastor. They also uh, u- they also um, u- they also uh, employ they also used uh, sympathetic they also leveraged sympathetic whites whites, especially Jews, um, and and quote unquote limousine liberals, basically wealth basically wealthy whites who would donate to liberal causes. Um, interesting thing is uh jews were very were like despite being a minority of america's uh population they were very much disproportionately involved in the civil rights movement among the white groups uh they were often they were often the ones who were providing research about how harmful segregation was as well as providing uh law services to you know get set to get um, civil rights activists out of jail, it's a pretty it's a pretty nice history of just you know minorities working with other minorities to combat injustice. Gotta love that part. Gotta love that history. Gotta love that part of American history. So, unfortunately, civil rights was long. Any meaningful civil rights progress was long blocked in Congress and states. So the first victors came with the courts. Until 1954, the the courts supported the the dubious idea of separate but equal doc, uh, separate but equal that was defined in Plessy versus Ferguson. They also also they held that legal equality did not mean social equality. Yay! <laughs> At, in order to respond to this, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, basically a black civil, basically the premier black civil rights organization, carefully went after narrow cases that were obviously unjust, starting with law school discrimination. Even if they only got at most, you know, even if even if just if it's just in a roped off area. 
They managed to achieve a major victory with the Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision in 1954, which dictated that race-based segregation violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Separation was held to be un inherently, un inherently unequal, you know, citing social science that demonstrated the harmful, the harmful effects, psychological effects of segregation, namely how African Americans, you know, had a sense of inferiority. However, uh, they did not at the time spell that segregation was inherently unconstitutional. Now, the Supreme Court dictated in a later decision that uh, a year, one year after that, all delivered speed must be made to desegregate schools. Unfortunately, as one would expect in a very racist America in the 1950s and 60s, this, uh, this pace was painfully slow. There was massive sustained white resistance. Hundreds of public schools were just closed or privatized every time there was an effort to uh, integrate them. Just to give you an idea of how like much of a fight people were putting, it took the military. It took you know the federal government had to step in with military force to actually, uh, you know, force integration in a de jure segregated South. Also, you had like extremely hands-on courts ordering up student busing and de facto segregated, de, and de facto segregated North. In terms of like you know, just giving an exit. Of an, in, just give you an example of you know using military force. You have probably heard a case of Little Rock Nine. You know nine black students want to go to what was historically an all white school. The white res, the white pushback was so toxic and so dangerous. The governor of the state himself called the national guard to just simply not allow the black students in. But President Dwight D. Eisenhower needed to um, first nationalize the federal the nationalize the national guard federalize the national guard. So basically the governor lost control of them. And also deployed the 101st Airborne Division. If you want to know what that what that was, that was basically a paratrooper division dropped in the first, in the Second World War to beat the Nazis. So yeah, pretty severe. Now, on the unintended consequences was you had some really nasty white flight and urban blight, and now you have segregation driven by a property prices. Yippee! Don't you just love progress being stalled? Integration also becomes harder as whites become a smaller minority of school children. So, you know, you initially had some major progress, you know, uh, like ever, you know, in 54, basically there were zero black students in majority of white schools. But over time, especially in the 80s, you had a peak of black students attending white schools. And uh, yeah, this is just an example of like, you know, the pushback to, uh, you know, black students attending uh, majority white schools, you know, you could see the whites in the background are taunting this one black uh, st female student trying to attend a white school. Yeah, this was not a very, this was a really ugly time to live in, especially if you were black or any minority. So anytime someone says the 50s were great, just tell them no, no, they, they never were. But unfortunately, there has been a, let's just say a backsliding uh, ever since the 1980, late 80s. A smaller and smaller share of black students are in majority white schools, where now it's at 23 point, where it's now in the 20%. To give you an idea, when was that? The last time, that was roughly in the late 60s. So yeah, not good. The Of course, African Americans just didn't just stop at the courts. They also uh, campaigned aggressively in Congress in order to get onto the national political agenda. They had dramatic confrontations like boycotts, freedom rides, and sit-ins, much like Gandhi, much like the Gandhi strat, what the strategy Gandhi used to protest against British misrule over India. This was all part of a campaign of civil disobedience, and unfortunately, though these weren't always, unfortunately, not all the protests were peaceful. There were violent demonstrations like race riots, but um, but this was mostly a conflict between the agenda setting and coalition building factions. Like, you know, like the more radical, like the more radical and hardline elements of the civil rights movement or and the more uh, moderate and more reconciliatory element factions. Um, now, like some of the things that helped accelerate civil rights change was public opinion was uh, shifting in African-Americans favor, especially among the young. You also the global decolonization, you know, 1960 was the year of Africa where a bunch of African countries got their independence that basically, you know, pushed this idea of, you know, now's the time for, you know, people of color to, you know, grab to basically obtain their rights that were, long, were, that were denied to them too long. There's also like that moral force, like, you know, how can you morally, how can you justifiably, like, defend segregation? Um... 
you also the JFK assassination. L- L- Lyndon Baines Johnson brilliantly used this, mo- this like the you know, the mourning period to to ram through civil rights legislation. You also had in 1964 a landslide elections that allowed Democrats to sweep Congress and the presidency and thus pass civil rights legislation. You also had uh, jo- Johnson um, using like threatening to use the discharge petition. Basically, it a discharge petition blasts a bill out of committee and and uh, puts it onto a. F- vote on the full house floor he was doing johnson trying to do it like threatened to do this because he knew that the committee was dominated by the committee that was dealing with the civil rights at civil rights bills were mostly dom- was mostly dominated by the south southern politicians who were not exactly sympathetic to civil rights and you could just see like you know the increase in increase in civil you know the shift in favor of civil rights you know in it you know in the in the seven, like you know, really up until like you know the seventies, um, many like white southern, many southern Democrats vehemently opposed civil rights, but by the eighties and the nineties, it was overwhelming support. You know, um, today much like you know, there's a lot of good things, a lot of good progress has been made. Blacks now vote as much as whites, and they and they have political power. You know, not just Barack Obama, but also at like you know the local. At the you know at the congressional level, you know you have you know several you know several black uh, members of the House of Representatives, but even more so, you see uh, African American political power at the local and st- at local levels. You know, in many st- in many cities in the South, many of the mayors are African American. Plus, they have plus a long dis long disenfranchised minority group has some you know real has some real capability to enact change for everyone's benefit. You know, you have like, like I said, ten thousand black officer office holders. Unfortunately, um, there's still a lot of there's still a lot of things that is left to do. The white black net worth slash wealth gap is thirteen to twenty times. I mean, that's just a that's just insane. The unemployment ratio is still two to one. Thirty-eight uh, percent of black children live in poverty, which is one of the higher percentages. Um, you still have many like you know conservative states try to enact voter suppression laws to like you know uh, disenfranchise African Americans. Examples can include removing early voting or removing mail-in voting, which many African Americans rely on because they can't they can't get off work on a voting day in order to go to the booth, so they need to mail in their votes or vote early so they can still work. Um, you also have the like you know the. You know, police officers shootings of black children, like of black men, black men, and you know, um, boys like Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner. I think this guy was twelve when he was shot. Um, you know, Ferguson. You know, the Ferguson. You know, the Ferguson and Ferguson shooting and all the back and all the you know messy consequences of that. You know, you also have like you know Black Lives Matter, like you know the don't shoot. You know, just don't shoot at. Pleading the police officers not to not shoot blacks, as well as uh, you know Colin Kaepernick kneeling during the national and during the national anthem, and of course you have this you know Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia turns out his yearbook either he dressed up in blackface or a Klan uniform we don't know which one is him but yeah this is this is we have much we have much more to go I am not I am not going to argue against that so what's unique now. Now we have to talk about uh, women, the push for women for women's rights. Now women were in, were an interesting situ- were in an interesting situation. Rather, uh, unlike blacks, they were arguing against a system that claimed to protect them. You know, the reason why women couldn't work was because uh, a Supreme Court decision that argued that uh, women are not physically capable to are not physically strong enough to work uh, long hours as much as as much as as long hours as a man. Now, initially, this decision was meant to protect female workers, but end up being really sexist. Um, you know, basically, this protective uh, paternalism was a cult- cousin of the cult of this domesticity. Uh, you know, of course, women are not going to sit around and just let this happen to them. You have a, you know, a push for uh, equal rights of, between the genders, like starting with the Seneca, Seneca Falls Commission, Seneca, Seneca Falls Convention, my bad in 1848 and the passage of the 19th amendment in 1920 which grant women equal, which grant women the right to vote you also have like you know the image of rosie the riveter in the second world war and uh, you have like you know feminism coming in another wave in uh 1960s starting with the publish the publication of the book of the feminine mystique 
the and, and the Congress and Congress and the courts respond to this shift in public opinion. So examples of illegal gender discrimination are like different pay, different drinking ages, different health benefits. But there are some forms of legal discrimination, like you know, uh, women don't have to register for the draft but can fight in all forms. Um, although women were only recently allowed on combat roles in the army, which is funny because the Soviet Union and China have long allowed women to serve in combat roles. You know, the Soviet Union starting with arguably the Russian Civil War and uh, you know Second World War. Women cannot be charged with statutory rape because it's just really like the power dynamic between a man and woman is uh, is very much unfortunately heavily weighted in favor of the man. So really, women can't be really charged with statutory rape. States can give widows uh, tax exemptions, but not widows tax exemptions, but not not widowers. Examples now. Now we're gonna talk about now. Um, in terms of sexual harassment, there are different categories, such as the quid pro quo or sexual play play for pay or job promotion. Now, now, the employer is strictly liable even if they don't know. You also have like a hostile work environment, hostile work environments so like teasing, jokes, and obscenities. The hashtag Me Too movement was a res was a response to the to this. And uh, yeah, and like you know, the Me Too movement, like you know, involved some very powerful individuals. You know, this is just a picture of some of them, and uh, a lot of these faces you will mostly recognize. You know, Harvey Weinstein, um, Al Senator Al Franken, Bill, former President Bill Clinton, TV host uh, Bill O'Reilly, Bill Cos, Bill Cosby. I think this is Charlie Rose. Um, you know, current President Donald Trump. I think that's uh, I, I forget. I know he was like charged with like having like sex with a fourteen year old. Ugh, that was messed. That's messed up. Um, yeah. If you want to know who these people are, yeah, basically. Now, um, now what I'm gonna talk about next is gonna be very controversial. So please don't say nasty things in the comment section. It's about abortion. <laughs> so the Ninth Amendment states that just because some rights and slash liberties are enumerated or made explicit doesn't mean that there aren't others implicitly re retained by the people. Basically, just because the just because the rights aren't stated in the Constitution does not necessarily mean you are you don't have those rights. Privacy has been judged to be one of those unenumerated retained rights. Um, as a result, this this. This uh this right to privacy has been the basis of the Roe v. Wade decision, which basically allow a woman's right provide a woman the right to pr right to privacy and reproductive issues. In this case, abortion. Now, abortion right abortion rights as narrowed as court as the narrowed since nineteen seventy three as which when was when which was the date of Roe v. Wade as courts have gotten more conservative. States now allow. St State courts now allow state laws that do not present an undue burden on a woman, like you know, reducing the time period um, from six months to 20, re 20 weeks. Uh, minors who are doing abortions must inform parents, but uh, informing the husband, according to the court, is an undue burden. Um, partial birth abort, partial birth abortions, which I have no idea. <laughs> what that even means which are very rare bans have also been upheld now of course the court will not stand by every abortion rejection for abortion restriction for example 2015 at the Texas texas abortion clinic restrictive laws were just overturned um funny enough some off like an off a offer who subscribes to yeah freakonomics uh, attributed dropping crime to Roe v. Wade. Basically, if you abort all the criminals, there are less criminals, and therefore, um, uh, less crime. Now, I personally don't believe this. This sounds like a really massive stretch. <laughs> Freakonomics is known for making these stretches, so, um, funny enough, Roe herself is now pro-life, and, uh, you'll probably see, we'll probably see Roe v. Wade overturned, because Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, two conservative justices, um, are, prob are gonna most likely f vote against Roe v. Wade if a Roe v. Wade decision comes up. So, just, um, you know, like, some of the, like, you know, 
terminology or details when, if you don't know much about abortion. Basically, the two sides are you know, pro-life and pro-choice. Pro-life, they want to get rid of abortion. Uh, pro-choice, they want to have the, uh, the choice to have an abortion. And the question, the main fundamental questions are, when does the clock start running? Like, when does, um, like, when does, when is debate, when is human life really conceived? When is it viable? When is it able to feel pain? There are roughly like 650,000 abortions per year, which is down from, which might sound a lot, but for a bit of context, it's down from 1.4 million in 1990. Um, basically, this abortion is like the, at the heart of the non-economic culture war. Um, funny enough, it was legalized in Ireland in 2018 and very recently uh, legalized in South Korea. And of course, this, uh, and uh, that we just came from abortion. That was like, what this controversial topic? Again, please don't make some nasty comment in the comment section. My God, just... You can talk about it later with one of your friends or parents or whatever. So the the key like tension with affirmative action is the battle between equality of results versus the equality of opportunity. Truth is, we are miles away from either. Um, you know, uh, we we have to ask ourselves like you know should law be colorblind? John Roberts has argued the way to end racial discrimination is to stop discriminating based on race. But, you know, the 14th Amendment was specifically made to uh, possibly benefit African Americans. You know, there's a question of should we have reparations? Should we have restitution? Um, should affirmative action be examples of such? Um, you know, there's you now the the the, dial, the debate between compensat compensatory, act, compensatory actions versus ongoing preferences. Is diversity a compelling government interest? Um, that's at the heart of a cult. This topic, this whole term is at the heart of a culture war. I don't want to get into that. Um, is it better to fail the super selective school than succeed at a less selective school? Um, you know, is it bigoted to have low expect? Is it soft bigotry to have low expectations of certain groups of people? Um, just to give you an idea, um, Asians need to score a very a much higher standard deviation than blacks in order to get into Harvard. Um, certain universities have like targets for minorities, you know, points versus a plus factor. There's accusations of reverse discrimination, although personally I think this is BS. It's just, personally, I think it's a little, although personally I agree with this sentiment, it, that's, this, is just, this is just impossible due to the asymmetry of power. Like whites generally in this country have, like you saw that statistic, 13 to 20 times as much wealth. Like that, it, I don't know how you can reverse discrimination when whites just naturally have much more power in the United States. Um, funny enough, this is really the question about foreign aid. Like, you know, um, Americans believe that something like a third of our budget goes to foreign aid when it's like less than a percentage point. You know, they just exaggerate because like they just tend to look down upon it. It's like, oh, we're giving money to like, you know, poorer countries when it's a tiny amount to begin with. Now, one of the few pot, one of the few like things that we can unabashedly say there has been major progress is gay rights. Uh, until 1973, homosexuality was classified as a mental disorder, and homophobia was massively rampant. Just ask one of your parents or grandparents. You know, did you hear the the, sl the homophobic slur? You know what it is. <laughs> it starts with an F. Um, and I, now progress began to begin you know began to accelerate in 2003 when same-sex marriage was legalized in massachusetts since 2015 it has been legal national nationally it's the fastest social change in history like you know not that's an you know basically now people say not that's anything you know in the past there was vehement opposed opposition to homosexuality but and gay marriage but now it's like meh we don't you know people well most people there are major exceptions usually don't put as much of a fight now, of course, I'm not saying homophobia doesn't exist or discrimination of gay people against gay people or lesbians or you know anyone who is like who doesn't like fall into tra traditional sexual categories like that d discrimination against the people. I'm not saying discrimination against those kinds of people doesn't exist. I'm just saying like you know it's a lot of progress. Now, unfortunately, private institu institutions can still ban gays like Catholic schools, uh, evangelical schools. Boy Scouts, like for a while, could do so. Now, they, now, recently, they've dropped the policy. The you know the now the real battles moving on to like you know trans versus cis, etc. Um, 
just just to get and now don't think that we're exceptional if this other countries have already legalized gay marriage like the never you know the Netherlands in 2000 in 2000 Belgium in 2003 Canada in 2005 Spain in 2005 Spain in 2005 you know this is really interesting Spain was one of the most hardcore Catholic countries and that and and it was one of the earlier European countries to legalize gay marriage with overwhelming support. South Africa legalized in 2006, Norway in 2009, Sweden in 2009, Argentina in 2010, which is interesting because Argentina, being a Latin American country, it means it's also very Catholic and thus very resistant to gay marriage, the idea of gay marriage. But, you know, recently they decided, hey, what, let's legalize it. Iceland in 2010, Portugal in 2012, Denmark in 2012, France in 2013. <laughs> Uh, which is interesting because France is very secular, so I'm wondering why it took why did it take them so long? New Zealand 2013 and Uruguay 2013, and Taiwan just recently legalized it. So, you know, progress marches on no matter how long it uh, takes. So, just to give you an idea, like you know, uh, this is the percentage of Americans identifying as LGBT by birth code cohort you see that millennials are i like ha, are the most likely not 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 because they're just they just happen to be more gay or lesbian it's because they're more like there's less stigma among their generation to come out as openly gay or openly lesbian unlike say you know traditionalists where you would have been really screwed over if you were if you came out openly as gay now, um, when it comes to the rights of uh, illegal immigrants, many protections apply to persons, not just citizens. For example, the children of illegal immigrants can go to school. They are also entitled to some, not all, welfare benefits. Now, little point of, now, contrary to what you might hear, illegal immigrants and immigrants in general use much less welfare benefits than native-born native born Americans. So don't blame. So please, for God's sake, don't blame the. Don't blame don't blame illegal immigrants for your, for wealth for stealing all your welfare checks. It's just not true. But they can't vote while still having to pay taxes. Now, when it comes to rights of the disabled, employers must make reasonable accommodations. Uh, transport accommodation accommodations must be to the maximum extent must be made to the maximum extent feasible. But they can't create undue hardships. And that is all. Thank you for watching.